we're just about to start our session with Jonathan King. So we sat down and had a chat with Jonathan about his book, The Inkberg Enigma, didn't we, Neil? Yeah, about, about a week ago now. Yeah. It, it's a fabulous one. Uh, Jonathan is probably better known, I think, as a film director, although I think that's changing because his work as a graphic artist is fabulous. And he's very much in that kind of action thriller adventure types comics the, the inkberg enigma really rattles along in a kind of dramatic like it is it's, it's an a, a exciting tale in and he talks about this a lot in the, the interview in the same sort of genre as perhaps hergé's tintin the later ones are Exactly. It's a classic adventure tale and it's fun and rollicking and wonderful. And we got to chat to Jonathan about that and we'll play the clip very shortly and then we'll have a live Q&A with Jonathan. So if you're watching the clip, um, send it, go to slido.com and enter in the code COMICFESTNZ and mm. then you can ask a question for Jonathan at the end who will be popping up for a live Q&A. We'd just like to thank our sponsors, Unity Books, Graphic and Gecko Press. Today is International Free Comic Book Day, so head down to Graphic and get your free comics. Also, we're here at the National Library in the Comic Fest Studios. The National Library and Wellington City Libraries are the team who have put on this event to help celebrate the amazing world of New Zealand comics. Yes. And also a big shout out for everybody who's getting involved. Um, Sam just told you how to get involved. And also people abroad, we've had people from Hawaii getting in touch with us. I know there's people in Scotland watching us. A big shout out to Alan Janet and Gala Shields. It must be like four o'clock in the morning or something crazy there. So it's great to have so much engagement of our community. Yes, thank you for streaming in and continue watching. And we'll head over to Jonathan now. Now. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jonathan King, and I make comics, and I also make films. So, The Inkberg Enigma is a graphic novel adventure story for sort of 8 to 12-year-olds. And as you can see, I'm in part of the world. So there are, there are mysteries, and there are books, and there are uh, weird things with tentacles and stuff. And um, I really wanted it to be the kind of... Um, Kind of rollicking adventure with an element of fantastic and sort of scares but but exciting adventure stuff as well which is and so that's kind of the same things i've been doing in films really too just wanting to tell kind of cool yarns of creepy and interesting things happening in the world that we live in i wonder if you could talk a little bit about your comic inspirations what you love about their work and how that influences the work that you do Hergé and Tintin was, was absolutely the kind of gateway, you know, uh, uh, encounter with comics that I had. And so I got given my first Tintin book by my parents when I was probably four. So I probably couldn't even read the words. I couldn't re certainly read all the words by then, but, you know, could, could totally um, absorb the story. So the first Tintin book I got was The Black Island, which is still um, one of my favourites. So there's a, you know, there's a kind of graphic clarity and... Um, precision I guess that I ha have always loved about those um, and now I guess my own tastes have, have got a bit you know have sort of broadened out beyond that and um, and even as someone who draws them I'm feeling a little bit boxed in by the by the um, the kind of uptightness of that style but it was always you know I always kind of amazed you know I loved the um, yeah I just loved the sort of the, the graphic um, sure handedness of it really and, and and it was probably a long time before I even had any confidence to try and draw in that kind of style and and to be entirely honest I, there's no way I could do it without um, a bit of computer aided assistance um, being you know primarily being um, drawing in Clip Studio Pro which is a digital program um, and and even making kind of 3D 3D models of environments sometimes and using those for you know, for the kind of perspective and for cars and stuff even too. Um, but AJ had a huge studio, in fact, in this kind of heyday, he had a studio of a dozen people working for him. And, um, you know, the, in the, the busiest years, other people would draw the cars and the planes and travel to those countries to see what the, you know, the vehicles were like and those things. And other people would draw it and he'd draw the characters and stuff. Um, 
So, um, so my budget <laughs> doesn't extend to that kind of thing. Um, so I'm working out, I guess, yeah, shortcut ways or ways of doing it all myself. The level of detail that you've gone into placing this town and the sets seems like it would be quite a headache to draw. Yeah, and that's what you, you one realises when you're a third of the way through the book, and oh my god, this is going to take me forever to, to finish like this, and I, I sometimes look at people with a, a looser, sketchier, uh, you know, painterly kind of feeling, it's like, oh my god, I wish I could knock something off like that, and, but what it is, what it can be great for, that level of detail, for a sort of sense of place, and really framing it somewhere in a, a sort of specific space, so my story is, like, I want the locations of my story to feel specific, but in fact, they're not specifically New Zealand. And, and the book has been published in the UK and um, the US and Australia through Gecko Press, my publisher. And I would hope that kids there aren't going, oh, here's this New Zealand, you know, I'd be fine for kids to not go, oh, here's this thing set in New Zealand. It would be cool if they related to where it was, you know. So I, you know, the some of the places in my book are based on real places. So the town, the, the whole area is based on um, Littleton Harbour and, and it's called Diamond Harbour opposite. Then most of the town is based on Littleton with the whole the whole kind of old fishing works kind of grafted on and, and that's sort of based on Cannery Row in, in Monterey, California, of which not much is left, but there are amazing pictures of what was there. And then this kind of Larnack Castle has been plunked on a particular place there so I can still go to those places and I can stand and look at the town and I I feel like the fishing works is going to be behind me and I turn around I'm always a little bit surprised when it's not like the adventure story the heyday of the adventure story was you know the 30s or you know because Ajay started making comics in the 30s 1929 was the first Tintin book so the 30s 40s, 40s and 50s were kind of the heyday of the adventure story you know and, and he came from Belgium Belgium which was a very colonial a colonial power and you know, there were the, it's a sort of story tradition of plucky white fellows going to um, going to places where no civilized person has been before. You know, and so and and Ege's politics um, are not um, are not spotless, but in fact he grew his his own awareness grew over time. You know, and so he Tintin in the Congo is the is probably the second book I think, and is is the most. Um, <laughs> And Congo was a Congo was a Belgian um, colony, and um, you know they kind of pillaged the place and then left. But Ege's politics, and, and so you know the stories go to South America in exciting ways, and Tibet is a great great story, and um, in the Middle East and things. But his politics and his awareness kind of grew over time, and and he's, you know, he's he he he, he and Tintin do, do you know fight for the underdog and fight against oppressors and exploiters and stuff which I think is great but but we don't have the same relationship to foreign places now that they did in those stories and so I guess the challenge for me was where are places where those stories can still happen and even you know going out to sea you know is still a scary and exciting and dangerous thing um so yeah so I guess for me the place where it happened was going to be their home base but then I wanted that sort of danger and, and I guess un, unexpected creatures. And then Antarctica is still, you know, possibly, you know, Antarctica is, an, it, the politics I guess around Antarctica are climate politics, not, um, not you know, co colonial issues of colonialism and stuff. But, but Antarctica is a place where, you know, adventures and unknown territory, territory can still ha happen. And, and that too is a, a sort of site of, um, you, know, the, you know, the last... You know, it was the last frontier to discover the, you know, turn of the previous century. There's a sort of very, you know, almost iconic kind of Antarctica image there based on Scott, I think, you know. Yeah, so, so and, and, and my wife has been to Antarctica several times. So Antarctica looms quite large in our house. Yeah, so that's, I guess, why those things are in there. Yeah, looking for a way and a place to still have those kind of scary adventures, I guess. Yeah. Another influence is golden aged serial action adventure comics as well. Is that something that has influenced you and this story? Yeah, I guess it has, and that's actually what I've been. I'm, I'm more. I've been reading more in recent years. So things like Terry and the Pirates um, and Steve Canyon. So they're Milton Caniff and um, Frank Robbins, Johnny Hazard, and stuff like that. So the um, you know, and their politics are even <laughs> less. Um, uh less um acceptable now but um but the form of the um the the daily newspaper black and white daily newspaper comic 
adventure comic. You know, you had like four panels where you summed up yesterday, two things happened, and then you flash forward to you suggest something else is going to happen. And and just the kind of the way things are stacked up in those panels. So um, that's the kind of level of craft that I really love just looking at now. Um, and, a, and a level of storytelling. Yeah, so I do really love those, actually. Um, and that's, um, yeah, that's the sort of form that I really, really like. So yeah, it kind of has in a way, I think. Um, it probably has influenced the story, but too, yeah, that spirit of adventure and stuff, yeah. So then Berg and Nygmar obviously had a great love of books and literature, libraries and books and, uh, are a key part of it. I was wondering, how did you go about selecting the books? I mean, some of them are obvious, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but there's other things there. So I just went straight to the things that, that were really um, important to me when I was a kid, really. So um, the Moomin books, Tova Johnson's Moomin books, uh, the Three Investigators were things that I loved as a kid, um, Emil and the Detectives, um, and some of those things that we talked, I talked with Gecko Press about too, that we wanted it to be that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, it was probably a mixture of um, some specific um, nods to things that were important to me, and um, and then just filling up the corners with with things that sprung to mind. I think there's a collaborative process around filmmaking that with when you're writing a graphic novel, it's it's all on you. Yeah, exactly. And so there's you know there's two sides about that. The good side is you don't have to pay anybody else, and anything you want you can have. No one can say no. You can't have you can't have a herd of elephants coming over the hill. You can just have a herd of elephants. The downside is you've got to draw that herd of elephants, you know, and um, or whatever, you know. So you can have anything so long as you're prepared to kind of draw it yourself. And I and I, I started drawing comics, you know, a, as an adult, really, after making quite a big film. I made a film called Under the Mountain, which was a big, expensive film, and it didn't do very well. Um, and it was a horrible <laughs> experience making the film. Uh, and so com making comics was really liberating and joyous. So, oh my God, I can do anything, and I don't need anyone's permission. I don't need to raise any money. I can do whatever I like. And it was just glorious starting doing it. And, and anything I could imagine I could draw and... You know, sometimes it takes time. And you've got to concentrate and rub it out and do it again. But you can have anything, and that was amazing. <laughs> but then, you know, perhaps when you're further down on a big project, it would be nice to have someone else could could um, help me out with this. Yeah. Uh, so it's you know, and and the things you get from you know the the collaborations you get with other people, and and particularly music actually is just funnily enough, um, you know, working with a composer is one of my favourite things uh, about making a film. Comics don't have the soundtrack in the same way. No, indeed. So the the equivalent of that probably. I mean, I really love editing as well. So the the um the the I guess yeah, particularly editing and the so the the, the motion of of film and the pacing of it and how music can work with those things and build up to crescendos and take you down and be cheeky or scary or ominous and things. Um, so the equivalent is probably the rhythm of pages, which is something I think about a lot, the rhythm of panels and the rhythm of pages. And you probably, you know, it's, it's sort of a luxury to have a lot of pages to play with. Um, but I do think about that quite a bit too. And so where pages turn, you know, it's like, okay, I want, and, and EJ was a master at that too. And like, you know, it's probably that way, you know, forward action, things kind of moving left to right. Um, and, you know, make surprises on a, on, on a, panel you know page turn and then a shock you know shocks are on the next page not you don't want to kind of give the game away so i think about those things a lot too so those because i really like editing and i and i edit my um certainly you know i edit myself a lot edit my last film myself um so i think i think about that a lot um that's probably the equivalent i think about you know those the rhythm those rhythmic kind of things um i mean there's really lovely you know stuff people writing about Ege, which um, you don't notice when you're a kid or, you know, even as an adult, you probably don't notice, but when, when things are going well, he can move left to right. And then if he has, has a setback, he's, he's going right to left, which is like moving backwards and stuff. And, um, so I'm not always as rigorous about those things, but it's neat when you get the opportunity to start thinking about those things, to have noticed those things or learned those things and try and put a bit of it into practice. Did you have an imaginary soundtrack to the book or did you actually play certain pieces of music? while you're writing Berg and Enigma to get you in the kind of frame? No, I probably didn't really. Um, the trailer, so I made a trailer after I made the book, which I was just...
so I worked with a composer on that and, and gave him a couple of references, one of which was the um, the Tintin TV show has a great off to adventure kind of feel. Um, and then a, and a creepier um, thing as well. Um, so no, I probably didn't. I, I don't think I did really. I probably just listened to the kind of music. Um, you know, I'm, I listened to Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds and things, which is not very conducive to, to wholesome children's adventures. But um, uh, yeah, that's probably what I was doing when I was writing it. Thinking also about the role of the small town as the home for a lot of kooky characters to kind of see who's in the town and how can we make them interact, especially from a child's eye view. And that's quite hard to, that's probably harder than I imagined it would be. And um, I think I probably don't, or I realise that I don't have massive confidence with, you know, some people are amazing at characters, you know, and they fill their sketchbooks with um you know, dozens of people. Oh my God, each one of those people could have their own story. And so I don't feel as confident with that. You know, so it's so, so in a funny way, it's kind of a budgetary thing. Well, I can only afford this many characters that I know how to draw. I can work out how to draw. It's, oh God, I'm going to need another henchman here. What, what's he going to look like, you know? Um, and then what happens to him? Oh, should he come back later and stuff like that? Or who's the old woman on the on the wharf, you know? Um, so yeah, those things are hard actually, you know, and... and um, you know, what I, you know, funnily enough, because, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd done some smaller comics and, the, you know, like one or two page comics and then got up to like, I think my biggest one before that had been a 12 page comic or something. And then I did a couple uh, for the annual for Gecko Press um, that were a bit bigger. And and I was, you know, thinking I'd love to do a graphic novel. And then Gecko said, would you be interested in a, a full-length book? And I was like, yes, I would love to. But I realized once I started, it's like, I wish I was better at drawing. I wish I'd done a lot more drawing, you know, before now. And and because you realize you've got to draw everything. And um, you've got to draw things you didn't know how to draw. And you've got to work out how to draw it. Um, and, yeah, so, you know, I, I um, you know, I would love to have been better when I started and I would love to, you know, I love, you know, comics is, is wonderful. I really love it. Um, but, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure all New Zealand comic artists wish there was a way they could afford to be doing it all day, every day, you know, and go out to the cafe and sketch people in the cafe in the morning and then do some pages on your comic at night and things. But it's really hard, yeah, to find time to draw, to, you know, to draw as much as you like or to have drawn everything that you knew you we're going to have to draw too. Yeah. What tools did you use to help aid that process? You talked a little bit about 3D rendering and things. So when I started drawing comics, um, you know, the last 10 or 12 years, um, I started drawing with with dip pens. I've you know, still got one is there a pen on there. No, I haven't got the nib on it actually, but, you know, drawing with pens or a brush on card and then scanning that and coloring it digitally. Um, and then I got a Cintiq, which you can draw onto, and then an iPad, which you can draw onto. And I really do love that, you know, because of the, the ability to undo things or, um, oh God, the hands are too small. So you cut them out and make them bigger and stick them back on and and things. Uh, or flip something, you know, or um, you'll move how someone sits in the background and stuff. And then Clip Studio has amazing kind of parallel lines tools for bookshelves and things like that. I seem to always be drawing bookshelves and um, bookcases and bookshelves you know G Google image search is an amazing um, resource when you when you realize oh I've got to draw a car or I've got to draw a place that I don't know maybe um, yeah and and then for particular things I did some you know often quite rudimentary shapes but but sort of 3d modeling of things that I can well, things that I can use again, for example, like my museum building, my museum exterior, build it, and then I can go, and I can look at it that way, and then I can go do a low look at it that way, and and things. Um, and, you know, I'm actually tracing over the lines. to Yeah, so, you know, I, I guess I learned a lot about um, how, you know, even a style like this too, how how um, challenging it can be, you know. You, but, but people I would, you know, I, I did a bit of life drawing um, when I first sort of got back into comics, but, um, yeah, I mean, People are, you can't fake people, you know, you can't, um, there aren't, because, um, you know, you, in fact, Clip Studio has posable people, but if you draw over them, they look horrendous. They look like, you know, yeah, so drawing people, I would love to have just drawn, I would love to have drawn 
500 more people before I started having to draw a graphic novel, I think, yeah. Quite a few people said that the Inkberg Enigma is almost like a perfect first introduction to horror. Was that your intention from the get-go to have that element in the book? I, mean, um, I guess I definitely, there was always sort of a sea monster thing and, and um, at one stage there was more of a, um, you know, Nessie type um, plesiosaur kind of thing in there, which didn't make it to the end. But yes, there always that sort of fantastic slash you know, because even that Edgar Rice Burroughs, that sort of land, land that time forgot thing um, too, you know, I really love that, love those things. So the Jules Verne and Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, which are probably terribly old fashioned now, but I love, loved them a lot when I was a kid. Um, yeah. Is there a kind of New Zealand specific way of doing comics that is something that is evolving at the moment? For the most part, you know, I think it's un... Um, it's untainted by money, you know, which is a is mostly a good thing, I think. And I think Wellington has quite a healthy comics community. Um, anyone who knows what it's actually like, just is not going to give anyone else any crap because because they know it's too hard. And um, you know, so that's what I like about. It. That's what I really like about the local community and and things. And um, you know, and we you know we are incredibly blessed to have you know we've got some superstars in our midst. You know, you know I told my son who told a friend of his that Rachel Smythe from Laura Olympus lives in the next suburb, and this friend was flabbergasted. She had no idea it was a New Zealand cartoonist even. You know, and um, you know, and and Dylan Horrocks lives around the corner, and you know we're we're very lucky to have those people around us really. If you were to give advice to an emerging comic artist or graphic novelist in New Zealand or abroad, what would your advice be? Yeah, well, my advice would be to just start doing it. And there's absolutely, you know, there's nothing to wait for because nobody is, nobody's going to say now you can start or now here's your commission or, or here's your paycheck. Um, but there are no, there were two things. There are no barriers to starting. Um, and, and, and literally, if you're eight years old, start with a piece of paper and a pencil or some colored pencils or whatever um if you're 18 that's fine if you you know i was literally 40 before i started drawing comics and um so you're certainly not too old and you're certainly not too young and um and you can start doing it and you can share it however you would like so you can photocopy bits of paper and give them to your classmates or you can put it on your instagram or you can put it on Facebook or whatever, or you can get an, a, a URL and you can start sharing comics and stuff. So there's kind of there are literally no barriers to that. And and then the other thing is there are no style barriers either. You know there is a there is room for every single style. If you do what you do, then that is your style and that is a style and that's legit. And I, that's what's wonderful about comics, really. You know, and um, so you don't have to learn how to draw or you know you you. you Certainly for me, and probably for most artists, the, the, challenges, the challenges are not, oh, I wish I could draw like them, it's just wish I could draw the thing in my head that I want to draw. And, um, and that is hard, you know, and, and, you know, I want to draw hands, but the hands all come out wrong or whatever. Um, but you can, so you can get, you know, you can get better at your, you can set your own goals and get better at those goals through hard work. But nobody is, um, you know, nobody's imposing those things on what you do or, um, you know, or, or expecting those things of you. You know, there's just, a, it's, it's wide open to be whatever you like. And that's super exciting, I think, really. And yeah, and so things find an audience. And, and then, so, so, you know, you can find an audience, be it the people in your classroom or your Facebook friends or whatever, or, or you know, or different communities that people belong to. Um, and if you know it's boy oh boy it's hard work but you know people also find can, can you know can find fame and fortune by having a, a thing a unique thing too you know which is pretty inspiring and um you know though that's a pretty difficult thing to aim for it's not i wouldn't rule it out you know but start doing it start doing it. you can start doing it and you can do and you can own whatever it is you do and share it with people and that's awesome yeah. And what's next for you in terms of comics or graphic novels? Um, 
I'm writing a film. I've, you know, I've, I've, I've written a film which I'm trying to get funded and I'm writing another film at the moment, which is cheaper to make than the other film that I've written. Um, and I'm teaching. I have a day job to, <laughs> to pay for the three years that it's spent, I spent making a comic, making a graphic novel. So, I, look, I really love comics. I, I, am, I have found it hard to find time to draw comics at the moment now, too. And the other thing I found hard about making a graphic novel was, was publishing nothing for three years. So drawing more than I had ever drawn before, but having zero contact with the world as a comics maker was, was really hard. And so um, what I would probably do next time I do a comic, I will put them out online as I go, even if it's a longer project. I'll drip stuff out online, you know, and, and that's certainly someone like Dylan Horrocks did that as part of a book, you know, it's totally the magic pen was a graphic novel, but the pages can kind of drip out. Because, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I love, you know, we all love connecting with, you know, we love the people to see what we're doing, some feedback and stuff. And, um, and I'd love to kind of loose, and I'd love to spend enough time drawing to, to find a slightly looser style and, and stuff to, um, and which is probably more of that kind of um, maybe it's not even colored a, a, an ink, an inky black and white kind of style, which is a bit, you know, brush like, even if it was done digitally, a bit more of a brushy kind of um, loose black and white, looser style, um, which could be more expressive and expressionistic and a little bit less uh, uptight. <laughs> so, yeah. So, those are my comic goals, really, to get to do it again and to spend enough time to just evolve my own style a little bit too. And, and I would love to. You know, I hadn't initially, but I would love to, I, I kind of have a sequel idea for the Inkberg Enigma if my oh. publisher has asked me for it, but I kind of couldn't, I literally couldn't do it in the way that I did it last time, which was, um, uh, you know, do nothing else for, or not much else for three years, which was um, just too hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just, and, and, and see, there's, as, 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 as of course, you know, there's kind of, there's not a fast version of it. You know, there's the, there's the, you know, we all, you know, there's like, the, oh, I wrote an essay, you know, over the, overnight, you know, or, I, or you know, the, the story about the guy, the person that goes to a hotel room and, and writes a novel in two weeks in a hotel room. But you can't, there's a, there's a point you cannot draw any faster. You know, it's like a really good day it might be three pages or something. So, oh my God, that nearly killed me. I, I drew three pages today. But you can't, you can't suddenly draw 15 pages in a day. Um, yeah, so there's a real, which is, you know, what's amazing about it but hard about it too is that there's just physics of time and space and your your body what your body can manage and your brain can manage yeah hey, because it's exhausting you know you the level of the degree of concentration to sounds you know people might laugh you know but if you if you really did draw three pages in a day the, the degree of concentration is absolutely exhausting and um even if, you know, your arm's not tired. It's not about your hand getting tired, it's about your brain getting tired, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and you see, you know, and when you sort of follow artists online and stuff who work for the, who, who do it as a day job, um, you know, I think the demands of, um, you know, even to draw a Marvel comic or whatever, you know, it's, what's what if it's close to 30 pages in a month, you know, it's incredibly hard. And um, so I'm sure in some ways we would love you know, you can kind of count on the fingers of one and a half hands the people who are full time cartoonists in New Zealand, comic artists in New Zealand, can't you? Um, but it, it is incredibly hard to um, to do. Yeah. What What's the best thing about drawing comics? It's just the the sort of magic of a blank page or a blank screen that turns into it can you know turns into an environment that you imagine that doesn't. So making for, for me comics and films but 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 you know particularly comics because there are no other sort of budgetary requirements is creating physical spaces that you can believe in or you know characters and situations and physical spaces that don't actually exist um for me that's the best thing and, and a, a little bit for films as well too so worlds that don't exist for me is the the best thing i think yeah so i sort of like i said i believe i can go to those places and i believe those spaces that are in my comic and i'm always a little bit taken aback when they don't exist in real life you yeah. know amazing i think that's a great place great note to end on cool good thank you that was fantastic um thank you. great thanks very much we enjoyed it very much yeah i did too really great and i'm thrilled that you're in such an appropriate environment we I, know, for, um, environment. I can't believe we met 
Yeah, I'm, this is a green screen behind me, but I'm actually in my, the, I, well, that's actually oh. part of the crap, but, but I do actually have, um, I do actually have real bookshelves. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't that absolutely fabulous? And hopefully we have Jonathan online to answer some Q&As. Jonathan, a very, very warm welcome. Hello. Good afternoon. How are you both? We are very good. We have been streaming since 9 a.m. for this wonderful stream, and we're very excited to have you here. Thank you. It's really exciting to be part of this. It must be like telethon for you. Yeah, that's what it's exactly that's, like that. That's what we've been saying. It's like comics plus telethon, but no money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's raise a million dollars for <laughs> cartoonists. That's right. Hey, we've got some questions coming in. I'm just going to remind the audience that if you have any questions for Jonathan, go to slido.com and enter the code COMICFESTNZ into the code thing at the top, and we'll ask your questions straight to Jonathan. The first one we have here is from Monty, and Monty says, on the inside cover of the Inkberg Enigma is a lovely map with locales names after New Zealand graphic creators and comic artists. It's a great nod to your contemporaries. Can you give us a comment on that? Um, yeah, so I um, I love I love books with nice end papers, and I love books with maps in them. And um, uh, so a little bit of it was thinking about you know well definitely I was thinking about the geography of where my story took place, and I wanted to um, perhaps kind of formalise that if you couldn't quite work it out from the story. And um, I can't remember why or how the idea occurred to me actually, but yeah, you've you put in a map, you've got to give them place names, and I thought that would be a fun thing to do. So um, it's kind of a mix of uh, of exactly um, local Wellington, uh, New Zealand um, comics names, and a handful of other nods to um, to people I think who have been a big influence on on me over the over the years, or other comic international comic artists as well who have been an influence too. But little Easter egg there for um, yeah to spot. It absolutely made my day when I saw Sam's <laughs> Orchard. It was like, made it. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's funny the names the names that there's actually something quite fun to do with. Um... Yeah. We've got somebody who obviously knows your background quite a lot because they were asking about your music videos and how your music videos inform your graphic work, which is something, I, I guess, the connection between the two. Um, yeah, that's a neat idea. I mean, what was one of the, I, so music videos were kind of how I taught myself filmmaking, really. I didn't go to film school or anything like that. I just started making stuff, which was kind of my same thing as I did trying to get into comics as well. And, um, yeah, I guess one of the best things about music videos was being quite, um, you know, they were amazing, an amazing way of getting to try stuff out uh, again with a kind of low threshold to starting, you know, so if you could talk through your idea, the band would say, oh, that sounds cool. And um, and I'd give it a go. And some things were successful and some things were maybe less successful. But, um, you know, I was just thinking about it the other day, actually, you know, there were getting to make, you know, I, I, did, there's a, I did a black and white one that's set in the behind the scenes of a circus in a studio. And we, we had kind of circus caravans and, um, and, and lights strung up in a big tent. And, and now it seems incredibly... Um, you know, it could be ambitious to try and make a film like that, but we just kind of gave it a go for a music video. So I guess that was the the connection really is a kind of freedom of trying stuff out, which is, I guess, harder to do. It feels like it's harder to do in films now and, and good to do in comics. But I, I worked through a lot of ideas and a lot of short film ideas and a lot of story ideas in music videos, I guess. I guess it's a kind of perfect kind of testing ground for all sorts of things. Yeah, exactly. And... Um, you know, and you've, you've, in a music video, you know, you're serving the song and you're serving the band, I guess. So, you you know, I would often smuggle in the things that I was interested in, but also cut away to the band playing their song. And hopefully it gets kind of eyeballs on it, I guess. But lower, um, lower kind of stakes than, I guess, a film that you've spent five years trying to get made. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sally, who loved your Tintin-inspired um, trailer, by the way, asked, oh, cool. does your process of writing a film script differ from the from writing a comic script? Is one led more by the visuals? Yeah, definitely. So I, I kind of didn't, or I definitely didn't want to try and write the graphic novel like a film script. So it was much more about images and kind of out, laying things out on the page. And 
in retrospect, you know, I probably lost quite a bit of time because I was sort of drawing pictures, rough, rough pictures, but as I was writing. Um, and I went down a few false trails. And when you realize, oh, actually, that's 10 pages or 20 pages that's not quite right, you've actually sort of drawn it as well, which was which was dumb. But um, but I wanted it to be a comic while I was writing it. It's not the same as a film, and I didn't want it to be a film. Um I wanted I wanted to be telling it with pictures, yeah, and, and finding the look of things and people and places too. So um, very much kind of thumbnails, picture thumbnails with dialogue as I went, um, which is quite different to a film, which is very is all about typing before you do anything else. It, if I do when I do it again, next time I do it again, I probably will draw less and write more to make sure I'm on the right track. Um, but uh, it, it was important, I think, for me to make a big switch to. To doing a big comic that I that I approach it differently, really, yeah. Uh, we've got a really good question in from Maya, and she's asked, uh, "Do you think there are certain uh, stories that only can be told through comics, and why did you choose the medium of comics to write the ink big enigma?" Yeah, I definitely think there are stories that can only be told by comic, told with comics, and that's what's wonderful about comics. And um, you know, they, they, they're in some ways they're similar to films, but they're not films. And they're not the same as films. And and things like and you know, they're a middle ground between prose novels, even too. So you can show what people are thinking, or you can um, jump between timelines, or you can have flashbacks, or you can have voiceover in ways that are not always effective in films. Um, but in a way, you know, you've got you've got words, and you've got pictures, and you've got what picture is sitting next to what picture, and what page is sitting next to what page. And in lots of ways, they are, they, you know, it's more sophisticated in lots of ways than films are. And films are, are, are completely linear. And, you know, and things are blurring between games and films, perhaps. But, but, but between comics and films, you know, films are, are linear. And there's a massive price tag for every image and every pixel. Um, whereas comics can be bolder and... Um, in what's in the frame and the way frames sit next to each other and the kinds of stories you're telling. And you can t appeal to, to, to many different audiences all at once, whereas films, I mean, films almost have to appeal to the same audience, really, um, to, 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 in some ways to make their money back or, or, or more clearly defined audiences, whereas I think comics can appeal to many different audiences um, too. Yeah, so, you know, there are stories, there are, there are very important comics that will never be films, I think, because it would be, I mean, I'm seeing, even thinking of something like Mouse, which is an amazing comic, you know, a landmark comic um, that could never be a film because it would be crazy. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that's what's sort of wonderful about comics, I think. Yeah, absolutely. That's been something we've been discussing this morning with Mikhail and with Jim a little bit around just the diversity of stories that comics can bring and mm. the audience that that brings along with it. Mm. We have time for one more question before you go, but um, Seth asks, while working on your comic, did you try and draw nine to five? Like, did you have set drawing times or did you have milestones for progress and how did you keep yourself on schedule? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, you know, as I was saying, just in, when we were talking before, um, it's, it's really hard to do too much in one day. There's only sort of so much you can do. Um, so I, it was probably more in bursts. And, you know, I was working on it over a couple of years. And when things were going well, I sort of was drawing all day. And I guess kind of nine to five or nine to four or something. And, um, but, but I might do that for a few days. And then perhaps I got either exhausted and needed a rest or some other things to make a little bit of money or, or, or off down a few other creative alleyways. Um, but then when I was probably two thirds of the way through, I had a big burst on it where I was kind of working 12 hours a day on it um, just to try and get more done, to get a bigger percentage of it done. But it's definitely about milestones, you know, and even sort of spreadsheets or a little chart of how much you've got penciled, how much you've got inked and how much you've got colored. Um, but it's, it's pretty scary when you're only a third of the way through and um, the, the long, um, road ahead doesn't seem to be getting any closer, but it's it's great when you when, yeah kind of making progress. But um, but you know you know to anyone making comics, you know what's cool about it is you can chip away at it, and you can't you know the only things that are stopping you are time and space and brain power. Um, 
but if you can carve out a little bit of those, you can do stuff. And you know, I read, I read someone saying they they just had to draw a panel every lunchtime at their day job. They had a day job, and each lunchtime they had to do a panel, and they knew they were making progress. And it can be as simple as that, I think. You know, set set milestones that you can, um, you can see working, um, and you'll, you'll you'll make progress. Yeah. Amazing, thank you. I again, I wish we had more time to chat with you, but unfortunately, we have to go to our next segment. But thank you so much for coming along. A big apologies to everyone who's sending questions that we haven't got to. Got- where, if people want to contact you, where's the best place? Is it Twitter to have ask you some questions? It's probably Twitter, actually. I think, yeah, I've got a website, but it's in terrible, terrible disrepair. So, um, yeah. Just um, tweet at me and I will see it. I'll definitely see it. Yeah, and love to hear from anyone who's enjoyed the book too. A huge thank you. And as Sam says, we've got four or five more questions. (laughs) Yeah. And they keep cropping up more. (laughs) So thank you, Jonathan. Um, Your book's incredible. Go out and read The Inkberg Enigma. It's in all of Wellington City Libraries, as well as bookstores, libraries, Go and find it out. It's a major rollicking adventure tale. And thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's great to be part of this event. Hope it all the rest of the day goes well. Thank, thank you. you. Cool. See ya.